Is serverless taking over? This is kind of a hot topic right now. And I think a lot of the reason that serverless is so popular is because we developers, we're lazy people. I know at least I'm lazy. When I set up services to do things, I care more about the thing that I'm trying to build instead of the setup and maintenance I need to do in order to provision, launch, and maintain servers. And that's just something that no developer wants to deal with. So in this video, I wanna to talk to you about whether or not serverless is becoming the next big thing, some of the pros and cons that are associated with using it, and when it is a good idea and not a good idea to use in your applications. So let's go. All right, so first of all, I wanna talk about what serverless isn't, because I think a big reason that there's a lot of debate over whether or not serverless is really becoming the next big thing is because a lot of different people have very different definitions on what serverless actually means. It's kind of a subjective term. So what is not serverless? So in many different cloud service providers, such as AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, there are services that they offer that provide some particular functionality. Let's take AWS S3, for example, simple storage service. Now this service is very, very simple. It's a place to upload files. It's kind of like Dropbox for AWS. Now there's no servers involved in using AWS S3. That is completely hidden from you. All you do is interact with the tool, upload your files, and all of that stuff is handled for you. Now behind the scenes, obviously there are servers that are providing some kind of functionality for you, but all of that stuff is hidden for you. There's many, many more examples of this across any cloud platform, including things like AWS SNS, SQS, Step Functions, and many, many more AWS managed services. That's the key here. These things are managed services that hide the infrastructure from you and provide a specific functionality. So that's what serverless isn't. I'm glad we got that out of the way. Now let's talk about what serverless is and what most people mean when they say serverless in common language. So when people say serverless or building an application that is completely serverless, what they usually mean is that they're using a function as a service provider, sometimes called FAS. And as an example of FAST, let's take AWS Lambda, for example. It's a service that was launched in 2014 by AWS. And this is one of the first, if not the first, serverless computing platform. So what this service essentially allows you to do is upload code. You operate on the code level. You don't need to worry about launching servers. You don't need to worry about maintaining servers, doing the security updates, all those things that come along with building an application. That is not a problem in Lambda land. Now, the way these serverless platforms platforms Lambda included work is that you upload your code and behind the scenes, Lambda is maintaining essentially a fleet of computers for you. So you could do most of the same things that you could do if you had this code hosted on a normal server, except you don't need to worry about the actual servers that are hosting your application. All that complexity is completely hidden from you. Now this is a godsend for most people. You can build very quick REST APIs. In fact, I have a whole video on how to create a REST API using AWS Lambda in as few as eight clicks in the AWS console. So it helps a lot of people very quickly hit the ground running and start building something that actually serves a purpose. It's not just flailing your hands in the air trying to set up your infrastructure so that you can host something. So that's what serverless usually refers to. Now, like anything in life, there are pros and cons of using this technology. I want to emphasize here that serverless is a tool and like a tool, there's a right time and a wrong time to use it. So let's talk about some of the pros and cons. So let's start with some of the pros. Well, if you haven't already imagined, there's no hardware. You're not dealing with any infrastructure. There's no mention of servers at all in the AWS console. All of that is completely handled for you. Now, this is fantastic for people like me. I'm lazy, I don't wanna worry about that. I'm sure you're lazy too, and you don't wanna worry about it as well. Fantastic when you're looking at this from a usability perspective. Second, it's very easy to use. Like I said, you can get this thing going in eight clicks to set up a REST API. A lot of people can flail for a long time trying to set up their API, their REST API or event processing engine on AWS, just because there's a lot of complexity and a lot of layers in terms of managing servers on the cloud. The third main pro is that there's auto scaling. And this is a feature of many of these services. And I'm specifically talking about Lambda here, but this generally applies to most of the function as a service providers. Now auto scaling, like I said, comes as a feature. It's always on and it's enabled by default. And what this essentially means is kind of what I was alluding to in the beginning. 
AWS behind the scenes maintains a massive pool of virtual machines. And these virtual machines generally are on standby. If they're not on standby, then they're serving another customer's traffic. Now, when a request comes in to your Lambda function where you've already uploaded your code, if there's no containers that are already loaded with your application code on it, AWS will find a server for you, load that code onto that machine, and then make it available to your Lambda function, and that's where your code will execute. When people say serverless, there's no such thing as serverless. There's always computers behind the scenes. I like to think of serverless as just-in-time computing. It's the notion that you're not burning your money away by maintaining servers that are usually most times of the day doing absolutely nothing and maybe have a period of a couple hours of the day where they're working really, really hard. This is where Lambdas and serverless really shines, but more on that later. Now, the final benefit that I want to talk about is the fact that AWS is doubling down on AWS Lambda and serverless technology as a whole. And specifically, Andy Jassy, the new CEO of Amazon, mentioned in his 2021 AWS keynote that serverless was one of the fastest growing segments in all of AWS. And they are completely on the serverless bandwagon because they realize the value that it provides for developers. Now, they're also releasing new features that make it easier to work with serverless. Now, one of the main drawbacks with using serverless in the past was the fact that if you have a lot of invocations, you have many different containers. And if you're trying to connect to a database, you can quickly exhaust the connection pool of all these different Lambda containers that are trying to access it. New features like RDS proxy make this a lot easier. So you have a managed connection pool offered through a managed AWS service. So this is no longer a problem. Now there's extra costs with it, but it makes it easy to use Lambdas and use serverless combined with RDS technologies. Other advancements include Docker for AWS Lambda. So now you can spin up Docker containers on your AWS Lambda function, as opposed to just uploading your code. Super cool. They're really investing in this area. And by the way, I have a whole video on that reInvent speech that you should check out in the comment section down below. So we talked a lot about the pros so far, but let's talk about the cons because like anything in life, there's always a good side and a bad side. So what is the biggest con of using AWS Lambda? And by far the biggest issue with using Lambda is a phenomenon called cold start and cold start is basically an issue that is a side effect of that notion of just in time computing like I mentioned earlier we already learned that when a request comes in lambda has to find an instance provision your code launch that code and make it available for traffic that period of time is called cold start now the bigger your software application the more dependencies that you have and this is particularly bad in compiled languages like Java with a big class path um, you can have a very long delay between the time of when your request comes in and when that request is actually served by a container that has the code on your machine, sometimes up to one minute. And a lot of applications can't tolerate latencies like this. But the good news is that once the code is provisioned onto the machine, then the latency goes back down to normal in millisecond level response times. So cold start is unfortunately a side effect of using AWS Lambda, but there are options in mitigating the severity of this phenomenon. More specifically, in late 2019, Lambda released a feature called Provision Concurrency. This feature allows you to keep a number of Lambda containers up and running at all times, but I do find that this is quite expensive. If you find yourself needing this kind of functionality in the first place, I suggest you reevaluate your decision to use Lambda. However, it can be useful for those of you that are in a bind and looking to reduce your latencies. And the second con that I hear about a lot when using Lambda is the fact that there's feature restrictions. There's things like the maximum amount of memory that you can have available for a single invocation. And there's also things like the maximum runtime duration of a single invocation. I believe it's up to 15 minutes now, but in the past, it was as low as five minutes. And this means that if you had a processing job that took five minutes or more, then that request would be timed out and just throw an error. And Lambda couldn't help you with that. So for a lot of people, this was an issue, but since they're increasing the times lately, I expect this to become less and less of an issue going forward, but something that you should be aware of. The third con is that when you're building these applications on Lambda, you typically generate with a lot of AWS stuff. And when I say a lot of AWS stuff, what I mean by that is IAM users, IAM policies, different Lambda functions, API gateways, 
gateway endpoints. There's a lot of things that you have to manage when you're using these particular types of technology. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. This is just kind of a cost of doing business. Well, when you compare this with a traditional machine that you set up once and you host a whole bunch of APIs on it, it's a lot easier to maintain all those different APIs because they're all in one place. You only have one piece of infrastructure, generally speaking. But with Lambda, this can quickly get a little bit overwhelming. And it's something that you realize when you've used it for a while. There's a whole lot of things that you need to create in order to get your Lambda functions working correctly. So that's the third con. So we talked about the pros and cons of using serverless. Let's move on now to talk about when it's a good idea and a bad idea to using serverless. So it's a good idea when you have event processing applications. This is a great use case to use serverless technologies. And when I say event processing applications, for those of you that don't know, say there's a system that's generating events, maybe it's like a credit card transaction event or some kind of geolocation event, and you need to process all of those. And you can connect your Lambda function to something like an SQS queue or an SNS topic. And basically your Lambda function will be invoked whenever there's a message in the queue that needs to be processed. This is great from a cost reduction perspective because in your Lambda function, you're only billed based on the number of invocations, the duration of those invocations, and the amount of memory that you provision on those invocations. Now in traditional servers, if you set up an instance that's always on, always running, you're paying for that hardware all the time. But if you're only invoking your Lambda functions, when events come in, there's a lot of money to be saved by using these applications. Personally, I've switched over from using a server-based message processing environment to using Lambda functions for this, and I saved over 50% in a production use case. So just giving you an idea of the amount of money that can be saved by using these kinds of technologies. So that's a good use case, event processing. The second one that I think is a good use case for AWS Lambda and serverless in general is bursty workloads where latency sensitivity isn't too big of a deal. So like I mentioned, always on with servers is a bad thing. You pay for the hardware always, regardless if it's working or not. And if you have bursty workloads that are only executing during periods of the day and very low in other periods of the day, then it's not a cost effective way to use your money. You're gonna be spending money even when things aren't running. So if you have these bursty workloads, it's probably a good idea to use Lambda. Now keep in mind, there's this notion of cold start. So your first couple of requests may take a little bit longer than the rest, but if that's okay for your application, if response time for those particular requests isn't too big of an issue, then you can get away with using Lambda. And in that case, it's probably a good idea. Now, when should you not use Lambda? Well, the first use case is if you have consistent workload. So if you have kind of a baseline or very close to baseline traffic pattern where it's pretty consistent over time, maybe you have small cycles here and there, then it doesn't make sense to use Lambda. Overall, you're gonna end up paying more by using Lambdas when you have a traffic pattern that is particularly steady over time. Lambda is excellent for auto scaling, but it's not great when you have consistent traffic patterns that aren't gonna shift very much. You very much should probably use a traditional uh, server-based infrastructure where you just provision the amount of hosts that you need and maybe use auto scaling for it so that it'll go up and down based on your traffic. And the last reason where I think it's a bad idea is if you have latency sensitive applications because the unfortunate truth about using Lambda functions is that you don't know when a container is going to be spun up and you're going to get cold start. If you have a use case that requires a very predictable low latency, then Lambda is not for you. It's not a good option because you don't get those guarantees. If you're looking for those guarantees, go with something like ECS or maybe EC2. So finally, do I really think Lambda is taking over? Is it the next big thing? Well, it's certainly growing. A lot of people really love Lambdas, especially for prototypes and getting things out the door quickly. But I gave you a list of use cases where it's a good idea and a bad idea. And like anything in life, and as I've mentioned multiple times in this video, Lambda is a tool there's a right time and a wrong time and it's up to you to decide if it's the right thing for your use case. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.